welcome to Pandemic Parenting. I'm your host, Greg Freeberry, and we are here once again in Think and Evolve HQ in front of my bookshelf. And if you noticed, I got a nice, fresh new haircut, so I'm feeling spry, ready to go today. We got a very special guest, an amazing guest, one Miss Holly Ross. And Holly is an occupational therapist with a specialty in aquatic therapy. And aquatic therapy is a niche that I had never really heard of before. So I learned a lot about aquatic therapy when I interviewed Holly, and I think you are going to learn a lot about aquatic therapy and all the benefits it has. And beyond just occupational therapy and aquatic therapy, Holly shares a whole bunch of information on how to help you during this pandemic, including stuff on routines and building routines and alternative education methods and learning methods. So it's a really great interview. It covers a lot of aspects. So stay tuned through the whole thing because you don't want to miss any of this amazing stuff. So without further ado, I give you Holly Ross. Welcome to Pandemic Parenting. I am Greg Freeberry, and I am here today with our very special guest, Holly Ross, who is a educational therapist, or sorry, not an educational, occupational therapist. Um, and she works with aquatics and very um, cool, very little cool niche. So Holly, welcome to the show today. Yes, thank you for having me. So I do pediatric occupational therapy and my specialties are aquatics, vision, and feeding. So cool. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I usually just start the show with just asking you some questions about yourself just to get everyone familiar with you. Uh, Great. All right. Um, let's see. So how about, like, do you have a favorite, like, fictional character or superhero or anything like that? Oh, I'm definitely into Marvel lately. I am partial to the strong woman characters, I would say. Okay. I definitely like Wanda. She's pretty sweet <laughs> as far as Marvel characters go. And definitely, like, the strong, like, female presence is, I, I really enjoy that in the Marvel movies. Okay, cool. I'm a big Wonder Woman guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. She did good in a, a new movie, Red Notices, on Netflix, too. Okay, <laughs> okay. I have to check it out. Um, what's your favorite food? Oh, mac and cheese, hands down. I'm still a little kid, except I don't mind throwing, like, pulled pork or okay. carne asada or carnitas in there. That's great. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is there, like, a specific, like, brand or you just, like, anywhere, anywhere that has mac and cheese is all good to you? Um, preferably homemade. I'm not really, like, the box fan at this point in my life. <laughs> like, I usually, we mix, like, elbows and rotini noodles together and then just throw in cheese and different sauces and make our own mac and cheese. And then sometimes we put it in the oven and bake it. So, oh. yeah. That sounds delicious. <laughs> It's one of my favorite things, especially after I swim or something. I always want more carbs. Yeah. What's your, like, have you ever had, like, a favorite place to travel? Like, somewhere you've been or maybe somewhere you haven't been yet, like, a desire to go? Hmm. Somewhere I go very frequently is to the mountains up in Keystone is one of my favorite places to snowboard. And I've been snowboarding for 16. This is my 16th season now. So yeah. that's definitely my happy place. I love being in the trees and most people are afraid of that area. So there's not a lot of people and you can kind of be have like your own quiet space. And as far as a place I would really like to go would be France. That's my second language. So it would be really cool to go there and then I also have a pen pal that we met in high school originally like through our schools and we still keep in touch on Facebook so it would be cool to actually meet her in real life <laughs> oh so you've never even met in real life before no we wrote letters before like there was big social media platforms and then now we just stay connected through Facebook and message each other so I've never actually met her but we share our lives and got connected through our schools originally so uh -oh. it's cool neat uh, all right and finally, like, do you have a favorite little piece of wisdom or adage that's been like really powerful for you in your life? Oh, I'm not sure about that one. 
I know that more recently, my fiance actually probably teaches me this. He always tells me to kind of take like one moment and hang out in it instead of me planning. I'm a big planner. So he always tells me to try to just, you know, experience it and then let it go. Uh, so that's something that I've really been working on. All right. Being, All right. Present, being present. Being present. Yes. All right. Very good. All right, then. Well, thank you for answering my questions. I know there can be silly sometimes, but I think it's a fun thing to do. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you got into occupational therapy and the whole aquatics thing. I think that's super interesting. So if you don't mind, I'll tackle them in like two separate sections because aquatics started before OT ever did. But so for OT, I got into it kind of on accident, actually. So I was doing respite care, which is just kind of like meal prepping, um, playing games with an individual who had experienced a stroke. And he was in his 20s, so I was a teenager at the time. So just kind of helping him out in his house and different things like that. His mom actually said I should look into OT and I didn't even know what it was. So I ended up shadowing his occupational therapist and I really, really liked it. Because originally I wanted to do neurology or some sort of like metal artwork. I really like working with my hands and I really love the brain and occupational therapy ended up after the shadow hours being kind of a mix of both of those things. So I can have the complexity I want, but I can still be creative with how I approach things and come up with new ideas all the time. And then as far as aquatics, I started as a lifeguard. That was my first job at 15. And I taught soon after because sitting on the chair is kind of boring, although it's a very important job. Um, sitting in a hot pool area for a while, it, it's tough. Uh, to keep yourself engaged and focused. So I was like, as soon as I can get into the water to teach, it was great. So they trained me basically. And then I got my water safety instructor through Red Cross when I turned 18. And then I've been teaching ever since. And I ended up really identifying and working well with um, like the special needs population all across the spectrum. Um, I know wording sometimes I don't even want to say like neurodivergent just in general all across the board medical complexities diagnoses what's whatever have you and I ended up having so many spots filled at the rec center that I had a wait list because nobody else wanted to have private lessons with anybody else and I wasn't even an OT then <laughs> so I ended up doing like my own kind of special needs swim school in Michigan for a while and that's where I'm from and then later on I was said, you know what? I'm done with aquatics. I did it when I was young and I'm all done with that. So I'm an OT now. I don't have to do that anymore, but I still have those teaching credentials and things like that. So I kept have parents asking and asking and asking because there's not a lot of great outlets for kids with medical complexities or neurodivergent kids that um, parents don't necessarily trust a 15 year old to teach them how to swim. Mm -hmm. So in that case, people kept asking. So I decided to just open up that sector. And so I became um, an official licensed training provider with Red Cross. So I have an agreement that I can teach anywhere in the US. And then I tied it in with OT to kind of create my own little niche so they can have the experience of drowning prevention safety and a little bit of learn to swim, but also get gross and fine motor skills and sensory regulation and things like that. Awesome. It's a, it's a good combination of all of the different things kind of coming together. Yeah, kind of a happy accident in the end. Everything kind of just came together and it worked out. Yeah, you have, you have a lot of little really great energy about you, and I'm sure you bring that to your clients and everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm just curious, like, you know, why is it you're so passionate about what you do? So this is a hard question for me. I feel like I don't think about it very often. I'm, I'm kind of like a busy worker bee. I don't really like, like I mentioned before being present, I'm not super great at really thinking about that. So for this, I um, am really leaning on the fact that I really love challenges and occupational therapy provides this hybrid of being able to have my favorite material like neuro and art and creativity. And I get to put it into a real life application I am really not a big fan of things that I can't take with me. If it's something I learned in school and I can't really apply it to real life, 
those concepts were really difficult for me. So I feel like as an OT, I'm really passionate about that because I can take all the stuff I learned and I can tell you why it's important and what you need instead of it being like something you may never use. So I am a big fan of that. And I also feel like after OT school that everyone kind of has a right to engage in some sort of occupation. And that's an occupation is not necessarily your job. It could just be, you know, playing a simple game of Uno. It could be showering, dressing, swimming. All of those things are considered occupations in my field. Okay. So I feel like everybody has the right to enjoy some sort of occupation, no matter your ability. So that's where like my advocacy kind of comes in too. And I'm really passionate about making sure I can help as many people as I can with without overextending myself and just keeping a good balance there. Colorado has a lot of good programs that are funded through Medicaid so that families who can't afford like aquatic therapy, learn to swim, other alternative holistic therapies, they get funding through the state for that. So it's actually a really good state to kind of facilitate what I'm already passionate about. And then we can get families that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it to be able to have services like that. Wow. Oh. It's amazing. Yeah, I feel like I always seem to find the ones that just like really love helping people. And it's cool. <laughs> you got to bring in like all the your unique aspects to it. And, you know, really, you know, use your unique skill set to really help people. It's awesome. I appreciate that. Yes, I have seen a couple of your other interviews. You definitely picked the helpers. Yeah, sure. I, know. I feel like <laughs> I think I am that way. So I kind of just like want to congregate with all the, the people I want to serve others. Definitely. Definitely. So, yeah, so we are, you know, in the, the pandemic and I just read today that there's like a new variant uh, yeah. in South Africa. So that's like a whole thing that we're going to have to go through again. Um, I, the pandemic has started in, in my own business and your, yours as well. Like it's everything's kind of been going online, uh, more virtual because we can't be as in contact as we were before. So you know, how have you seen the like pandemic and forcing people to go to telehealth rather than in person? How have you seen that impacting families so far? So I actually started my LLC officially in February of 2020. So kind of right before the pandemic hit. So it was a, a little messy and definitely very challenging. I don't want to minimize how much it's been through for everybody. But I handled it, I thought, in a really nice way. A lot of my families made it through, I think, better than other when they talk to other parents that don't have therapy support or things like that. And like, oh, my therapist didn't do that. So I felt I did provide some good resources. So when we were forced to go to telehealth, I ended up um, using Google Suite and I ended up purchasing it and signing some agreements so that I could make it patient protected. And what I did was make a folder for each family and their telehealth sessions and the night before, or even two nights before, I would put the session plan in the folders so that parents could easily log in and see what they needed. And I was really specific for home therapy and for aqua therapy to make something that was items that would be $20 or less that could be done in the session. So either something you already have laying around in the house or something, if you go and buy it, it's not going to break your bank, especially if you lost a job or things like that. So those are kind of some of the strategies I used. And then I really tried to transition families well and give them a lot of support. So families were always worried about camera angles and things like that. And I, you know, just put me in the corner of the room. As long as you can hear me, if I get a spotty visual, it doesn't matter. As long as you feel like you're getting an appropriate therapy session, then we're kind of in a good place. So I think what made it so successful was just a lot of extra prep time on my part. Usually if I go to a session or I meet somebody at the pool, all that is in my head, not out in explicit form for families to see. So it was a lot of increased prep time for me as a clinician. And I think that's why I was so successful with my families because I just took a lot of extra time was at home. Nothing else to do besides, you know, working out and things like that. On my personal time, I really just put a lot of extra time into prep so that parents could feel the most comfortable when they tried to transition to something that was pretty much scary for everybody. 
Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very tough when you're just like thrown into this kind of unknown space and now you have to adapt. And that's great that you really, really take care of your clients in that way and really put in the effort to make them feel like this is accessible and comfortable. Uh, yeah, and I still have a few families that are telehealth. I've transitioned in Colorado back to in person for most of my people, but I have some families that actually moved away like further south in Colorado and I can't physically reach them anymore. So they're permanent telehealth families and they actually don't mind me doing telehealth because we've had like a good system working out of their session plans and things like that. So they don't feel as strained, I think, which is great. Yeah. Do you find the telehealth can be as impactful as in person if it's done correctly? If it's done correctly, yes. I feel like I can give parents the tools they need for therapy so that they can carry out the goal work they need to work on with their children. As, and then aqua therapy as well. We can transition those skills to the computer screen. It just takes a little extra time and a little extra prep work. And it also is me being very mindful of what kind of homework I per se, or skills I would give parents to work on during the week, mm -hmm. because parents had to take on these enormous roles of parent, teacher, coach, um, everything at the same time, a lot of parents were super strained. So I would try to make sure I gave them one or two concrete things they could take with them for the week. And they would even be five minutes or less that they could work on with their child and still see progress in their therapy goals. So I think it was me being mindful as well so that they could be more successful. Yeah, that's good. Like keep it simple because there's so many times where people are feeling like overwhelmed and it's like, oh, now this is just another thing that I have to do. But if you can just give them a little bit where they can at least make some progress, it's really, it can be really powerful. Yes. And I think that happens a lot in the healthcare field as far as giving too much information. <laughs> I have families come home and be like, doctor gave me six pages of paperwork telling me what I'm supposed to do. And I don't know any of this. So they always just throw it at me and I read it and digest it and then give them back a couple of things to work on. But I think healthcare as a whole can work on that a little bit better. I agree. Yeah, I, I like to keep it just stream, streamlined, simple as well. Yes. All right. I wanted to pop in just for a second and say that I think it was interesting how Holly, on one hand, she's like preparing, preparing, preparing extra, extra hard for her clients. But then it sounds like when she actually delivers the information, she streamlines it and gives it in very little, small, digestible bits so that parents don't feel overwhelmed so that they can actually progress. So like it's like in the background, she's doing all this extra work, extra hard, and that's part of her position. And then when she actually delivers it, to her clients and it's like these little bite-sized bits that are actually actionable. And I think that's super important in, in this time when things are very uncertain. When things are uncertain, our minds kind of go into like alert mode. We're looking, we're processing a lot more information. We're looking for all the like possible dangers and all this stuff. And that usually happens when we're thrown out of our stability, out of our routine, which this pandemic has done. So Holly has a beautiful remark of just keeping it simple to avoid overwhelm. And then, of course, once you become more used to it, then you can build on top of that. So that's just a, a little tidbit to keep in mind for all areas of life, especially if you're learning something new. Like for me, doing this show, for example, I'm just taking it one small step at a time and working on it and trying to get a little bit better every single day instead of trying to do everything at once. So... That's a great little thing to keep in mind. Just if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, simplify things. All right. So now Holly is going to actually start talking about aquatic therapy, which is really cool. So if you are interested in at all, learn how to swim and getting aquatic therapy for your kids, this is the time to listen. So let's go. Like aquatic a therapy thing that you're into. I'm just wondering, could you like explain a little bit more about how it works exactly? And in particular, are there like any exercises that parents can do at home with their kids and if they have a pool or a local pool or even the bathtub or something like that? Yeah, so 
Aquatic therapy, I'm still really working on this definition, which is going to sound bad because I run a business off of that. So I should really have a straight answer for you. But I really create like a customized plan based upon what the family wants. So I obviously am a certified instructor through Red Cross. So I can teach all the drowning prevention, learn to swim skills, things like that. And I'm an OT. So I try to tie in sensory regulation, some of their development, fine and gross motor skills, emotional coping is also another strategy you can use in aquatic therapy. And those are kind of like some general broad categories, but I think it's about the way you set up for the environment, the age range you're working with, and kind of what skills you're looking to have. So as far as some at-home ideas, I kind of broke it up into some sectors and I thought this would be interesting to share with you. So if you have a child that's six months and younger, you can definitely use the bathtub. That is a beautiful place to use it. And if you have like a big master jacuzzi suite tub too, then you're like at home for a long time because kids don't outgrow that for a while. So when they're younger, I really focus on just exposure to the water and getting used to that, different temperatures of water, the lighting in the room, aquatic environments tend to be kind of loud and bright. So that can be really overwhelming for young infants. And then in the very beginning, you can teach them breath holding skills. And that's really scary for most new parents. So, and this is not saying dunk your baby underwater and just, you know, cross your fingers. That's definitely not how we approach things. So when you teach breath holding, you can do it in a really simple way. Clear language, I usually say, you know, ready, set, four or ready, set, rain anything that would kind of indicate that water's coming. And then we pour water straight over their face. I mean, eyes, nose, mouth, and everything. You can even lean your infant forward a little bit so that you can ensure nothing goes into their mouth. And the more you practice that, after you've done it, you know, maybe around like 50 times. And if you have a bath every night and you do five trials, you know, you're gonna have success pretty fast. You'll notice your baby will close their eyes and you'll stop you'll see them stop breathing when they hear the cue of rain or pour and the water comes and then they'll hold their breath. It's a really good skill to start in the tub. That's one of my big ones for sure. Another one you can do is lots of skin to skin contact. The beauty of having a bathtub and a young infant is that you're in your own home. So you guys can both be naked and it'd be great. So it can be a bonding experience for infants. And then you can also do positioning where they lay on their backs, on your chest. You can also flip them over and hold them underneath their armpits and support their chin with your hands and you can practice on the belly as well. So those are some really good young infant skills. Okay. When you move from six months to school age, you can transition from like breath holding to mouth bubbles to nose bubbles. So there's lots of cool things you can do in the tub there. They can be in the tub by themselves as they get a little older and you can really help them experience what it feels like to float and things like that just by how you handle them in the water. And you can even begin to teach kicking as well in the tub. And then for school age children, like four plus, you can really work on some sensory regulation too. So as far as COVID goes, we were stuck at home a lot. We didn't have a lot of chance to go outside and do other things. So you can create an environment that is totally different in the tub. So if you have someone who's six, seven, eight, per se, you know, turn the lights off, get like a little projector on your phone or something like that and flash it off the ceiling. You've got really cool, yeah, lighted experience for kids that might need just a new experience. You know, if they go to out here, we have like Jump Street where they use trampolines, you know, you don't, we weren't able to do that. So having some sort of input to your brain that is totally different. You can create like an immersive environment for people to relax. And then once they're four plus, you can teach rhythmic breathing, which is kind of this pattern of inhaling and exhaling as you work with the water. And that's basically kind of where your drowning prevention comes in, not just being able to blow bubbles, but holding it at the appropriate times and then breathing at the appropriate times. And I actually have a couple pictures for you to kind of educate the cycle. I can share my screen. <laughs> Cool. I am gonna. This is good. Go. like uh, <laughs> my mom 
when she she had me like learning like dunking me in the water and learning how to swim before I could even walk and stuff so it was good because then I felt really comfortable in the water and yeah it's a it's a it's a great thing to like get your kids started early with yes and if you have kids that are really fearful of the tub say they had like a young drowning experience on accident or something like that. You can even start with a big bowl on the kitchen table. Of course, put a towel underneath it <laughs> so you don't get water all over the floor, but you can start breath work in a bowl. You don't even have to have a tub. So there's, there's lots of solutions that can really help drowning and decrease drowning accidents or anything like that in the future really fast. So this is the first picture I've got for you. And I kind of talked about that from the six months and up. So step one is holding our breath where we talked about pouring water over an infant's head and practice clear language, one, two, three, or ready, set, pour, so that they learn to hold their breath. And then after they can follow a little bit of direction. So it could be as young as six months, but some kids, of course, are going to take longer to be able to follow a distinct direction like that. So then you can make mouth bubbles and that one's pretty easy where you, you just kind of make a sound, any sound you want. You can be an elephant or anything and they'll copy you so easily. So nose bubbles is what I have pictured here for you. And this one's hard for a lot of people because they don't know how to explain it. But a really, really easy way is close your mouth and hum your favorite song. As long as you're humming, the water will come, the air will come out of your nose without any issues. Now, if you stop humming, you will probably have a failure. So you'll probably have like a, an option where you're gonna get some water in your nose, but as long as you're humming, it's coming right out of your nose and you can see those bubbles much differently on the picture because you can see them coming right out of my nose versus mouth bubbles are gonna be much bigger and brighter. So that's a way that you can kind of tell the difference when you're working with your kid in the tub. Yeah. And then the last step is that rhythmic breathing where you're taking a breath in your mouth as you come up and then dunking your mouth and nose in the water and singing that favorite song with your mouth closed to blow it all out your nose. And then you come up, breathe in your mouth and then out your nose. And then you just practice that over and over. The second one is another one of those core skills I really like. And that is, can be life-saving and that's floating. So here you have me doing a back float and there's kind of a common misconception that you have to keep your arms like an airplane. Well, most people don't float super great. Some people are sinkers like myself. So in that case, your arms go up over your head, and that is a really great way to help raise your center of gravity so that you float better. You'll notice in the white circle that my palms are facing up. That rotates your shoulders so you float better. You'll notice in the orange circle that my eyes are looking up above me. That also helps your positioning of your body to float better. And the blue circle, it's a little cut off, but my legs are together. I'm not doing anything funky or kicking my feet or anything like that. And the last thing you can do to support a really good float is take a big breath and hold it. Your lungs can be your own little life jacket for a couple of seconds. Awesome. awesome. I didn't so, really know so much uh, skill. That <laughs> there's so much skill. So I really try to focus on these three because there are so many things that I could have shared with you today, but these are really the best ones for drowning prevention, because if you can float, if you can rhythmically breathe and you can kick your feet, you can get to the wall of the pool. You can get to the, the sand and the ocean or the lake. You can reach a place that you need to reach without having any sort of incident. The last picture is just talking a little bit about kicks and how they kind of are educational wise. So the orange arrow is kind of what not to do. <laughs> if you bend your knees that much, it's not gonna be good. You're gonna sink pretty fast and it's definitely not gonna be helpful for you. So I always tell kids to imagine that their legs are popsicles, popsicle sticks, pencils, color pencils, crayons, anything that's straight that they could identify with. You could do lollipops because um, they generally have a long stick with them. Mm -hmm. And then you'll end up emulating the yellow and purple arrows and you kind of go back and forth from yellow to purple, yellow to purple, yellow to purple and you'll create a really good functional kick for your child and you'll be able to continue that forward. The other thing I would just like to point out on the kicking is that you should point your feet like a little ballerina because that will really help you propel the water away from you. So those are the main three skills I think are super important to start in the tub. Awesome. Uh, 
Yeah, the, again, it's, like a, it's a skill that's really important, I think, because you're all around us. And then, you you know, you feel like more comfortable on a boat or just like swimming in the pool, swimming in the ocean, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm a great swimmer and I'm really appreciative that my mom got me into it so early. Right. You can remember. And some of the things that I touched a little bit on, like how you can create that immersive environment for your kids, or if you make it dark or you change the sounds or things like that, as far as aquatic therapy goes, you can go with a desensitization environment where you make everything really quiet. So you give the brain a chance to relax from all the input it received, or you can make it very stimulating. If you spend a lot of time in front of the camera at school or things like that, especially during COVID, kids didn't have enough input. So then they were just like wild afterwards. So sometimes the water can give you a ton of input you're looking for, for your body and all these different senses and help you relax. Okay, very, very cool. All right, so there you have it, aquatic therapy. I think it was really cool how Holly talked about, you can create both sides of the spectrum. So like on one hand, you could like turn off the lights and maybe have a projector on your phone under the ceiling and create some sensory inputs. Or you can make it just very dark and relaxing and have sensory deprivation, right? So it's two sides of the same spectrum. And I also wanted to just interject and say, as an adult, as a parent, you can also try these sensory deprivation tanks. They have it in a lot of cities now. They're popping up all over the place. I've tried it before. And it's actually a very interesting experience because you, you put in like, little earplugs and then there's no lights absolute darkness and then you're just floating on this water and it, there's like a bunch of salt in it so you don't have to worry about like sinking or anything everyone floats on it and it's a very Im like incredible experience so it can be very relaxing and just like you can get in touch with your own thoughts because there's really nothing else to do except be in touch with your own mind so my mom has personally done it and she really liked it a lot too so just a suggestion, you know, this isn't just for kids. Water therapy, aquatic therapy can be for adults too. So go check out a sensory deprivation tank. Give it a shot. See if you like it. Maybe it'll be like a new way for you just like wind down, relax, and decompress a little bit. All right. So now Holly's going to start talking more about some functional aspects and advice for pandemic uh, that parents can use to implement in their household maybe bring some more stability into their lives. So let's get back to the interview. Uh, I want to take a little bit of a turn here and you kind of touched on it. Yes. Already, but like the pandemic has been very disruptive to just like routines. And I know you said you're like big on routines and organization and stuff. So, you know, why, why is it so important to keep a daily routine and, and, how can parents kind of help do that with their kids during this time when things are kind of like up in the air? I love this question. <laughs> um, OTs like me love routines. And what I call your bare bone routines are really what you should keep in mind as a parent. And once again, not requiring a ton of homework, um, keeping something really bare bone as we have three meals a day and they're the same time every day. Or when I wake up in the morning, I have to get dressed, I have to brush my teeth, and I have to make my bed. Those are the three things you have to do, whether you're going anywhere or not. This kind of tells your brain what time of day it is, how to go about it, and it also gives kids a little bit of structure to help them know what their day is like. So kids, we know their prefrontal cortex of their brain, their decision-making, planning, sequencing is developing all the way until like 26. So because of that, we, they don't have a lot of those skills we have. We know if we don't get dressed in the morning, we still have to go through the whole day's worth of things. But for kids, that routine, that environmental cue really helps them keep it together and feel a sense of normalcy when everything is a little off. So keeping some sort of bare routine, like I mentioned, whether it's that morning plan, it's a nighttime plan, it's a meal plan, whatever you do, keeping a structure that works best for your family. Or if you have a specific one with your family where you watch a, a show together at four o'clock every day, that tells your brain that, hey, it's four o'clock. We made it through most of the day and I should start getting ready for sleep. A lot of people had trouble sleeping during COVID and 
I believe from the OT perspective that it was just due to this really big breakdown in routine and your brain doesn't know when to signal melatonin to go to sleep. And if you have no indication other than night and day, you're going to have trouble sleeping. So you can always include physical movement during the day as well. Use of aqua therapy, walk outside, things like that can help keep that routine. And every human loves routine, not just kids. So Mm -hmm. it helps parents out if they have a specific routine. It keeps parents not having to think about all these adaptability things. If you have some structure to your day, you can kind of go on automatic. No one really thinks about, okay, I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm on this tooth. I'm on this one. I'm on that one. You kind of just do it and you don't pay attention. You're on kind of automatic mode. You want to be on that mode for those basic routines. You don't have enough energy to function at, oh my goodness, I have a meeting this. I haven't prepped this. I have a paper to write. You don't want to function at this high level all day. Your brain will be exhausted. You want some things to be easy. You know how to put on your socks without thinking about putting on your socks. So you want to keep those in line so that your brain has breaks throughout the day as an adult as well. A hundred percent. I know when I went out the day, I was just like making my bed and doing a little bit of reading in the morning. It just, it changes like the entire, you know, tone of my day a lot of times where and if I choose to like look at my phone or read my emails and now I'm all of a sudden like reactive, but like taking that little t- piece of time in the morning, just be like reflective really sets it off really well for me. So, and I think it, you're like you said, it's, you know, not just kids, parents too. Routines are great. Yes. And it gives kids that expectability. They know what's going on. So you also mentioned to me that there's in schools, you know, we're primarily teaching kind of like audio visual realm. And it's interesting because you're doing like the aquatic therapy, which is very like tactile, like a lot of feeling, right? So are there other ways of learning that incorporate more senses? And could you talk about some of these like alternative strategies that might be useful for kids that are feeling overloaded with the online learning and they don't really do well with audio visual types of things? Yes. So I love this as an OT. Once again, sensory regulation. People tend to tie this to an autism diagnosis, but that's not true. We all have sensory needs and we all need to meet them throughout the day. And it's important to understand your own body and what you require. So first, I just really wanna dispel this five sense myth going on. There are eight senses, not five. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, so we we know visual, We know auditory, which is hearing. We know gustatory, which is taste. We know olfactory, which is smelling. We know touch. But we also need to include what's called the vestibular sense, which is the sense of your head in space. And then your proprioceptive sense is how your joints move in space. So it's like your knuckles, your elbows, your shoulders, where they are in your body. Like if you're positioned like this, you know that you're in that position versus you don't know where your body is in space. And then the last one is interoception. That's going to be, am I hungry? Do I have to go to the bathroom? Is it time? Do I feel sleepy? Am I kind of awake? Am I focused? That kind of thing. So really want to point out that there's a lot of senses. Yeah, yeah. I never before until this. Yeah, it's it's the OT realm. I feel like we we can keep working on this as a profession as well to educate people about this. So school, like you mentioned, is audiovisual, especially on a Zoom platform. So you have the picture of the screen and you have the teacher talking to you, and that's it. Um, a lot of people can't learn with just two senses. So. In general, I'm gonna go through some examples, but I would say the thing to keep in mind is the more senses, the easier it is to remember it. So if you only have one pathway going in for one memory, that memory is gonna be a lot harder to find later versus if you memorized it with five senses, it's probably gonna be really easy to remember when you have to take a test. So one example I like to use is like a simple math problem. Two plus two is four. So for an example where you can use touch and proprioception and visual and audio, you could say two, and then you can go plus two, and then you can go equals four. So the clapping, even though it seems really simple, 
is a non-language sound, which is processed in a different part of the brain. So it helps you remember a little differently. And you get proprioceptive input because smashing and crashing is the proprioceptive sense, also pulling and pushing. So if you think about those things, so when you clap, that's like some force. And I don't mean like a soft clap, I mean like stop. And kids really get into this because they would love to be loud and proud anytime they do something. Um, another example you can do with like history is I had one time in Michigan, someone who really struggled with certain facts that they were learning and they were second grade. I think they were working on history and weather. And she just really struggled with memorizing some of these facts and she was failing all of her tests and things like that. So we actually made a little obstacle course in her house that didn't involve like cardio endurance. I'm not saying do 20 jumping jacks and to memorize something because then you're physically exhausted and who's no, no one's listening when you're exercising. So simple things where you stomp your feet really hard when you think about a certain fact and then you run to the next station and it has to do with weather and the type of clouds and you toss a bunch of note cards in the air to simulate the type of clouds. So you're getting not just like a visual presentation, but you're also like seeing everything float around. You're getting the movement as you run. And then when you run and stop, you're getting your vestibular sense engaged with your head because your head doesn't just keep going when you stop. You run and then you stop. And then the fluid in your ears adjusts and you memorize more things. You can also work on reading in different positions, reading, laying on your back. You can even read upside down. If you have a particular part of a passage you need to memorize for English or something like that, those will engage different senses of your body. So it's really just thinking about outside the box learning with changing that head position, your joint space, and more senses the better. I know people that do essential oils and they do different scents for different subjects. And then it's easier for them to remember, oh, I was learning this when I smelled lavender. Smell is a really good way to trigger memory. So those that's a good one too. That's incredible. I've never thought of doing things like that before, but I can see how they could be really powerful. You build a much more vivid image in your head of what you're learning if you're having all these other senses incorporated instead of just like maybe reading a book or looking at a video or something like that. And it's really interesting because I think, and you know, personally, I wouldn't think to do those things because in traditional school, it's just like, all right, sit here and read this book or watch this video and do these notes. And then that's how basically everyone has ever been trained yeah. through school. So no one really knows these alternative methods. So it's like really cool to hear about these different, the obstacle course and all that stuff. Yeah. And you can build an obstacle course with pills and blankets. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but climbing engages that proprioceptive sense of your joints moving around and vestibular because your head's moving while potentially someone's telling you a fact. So you can memorize while you were doing something engages more senses and makes the memory stronger. Awesome. I have to try some of it with my students and let you know how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And you can definitely reach out to me too. I'm happy to help give you some ideas too. So it's hard to think about when you're not an OT sometimes. Sure. People tend to like, like I mentioned, sometimes people are like, we'll do 10 jumping jacks and talk about this. But if you make it exercise, it's too hard. It has to be something that it's not going to raise the heart rate too much. Okay. And then you kind of go into this exercise mode and your brain's not going to remember that either. So, okay, good to know. Good to know. All right. So eight senses. Everything we were taught in second grade was a lie. Okay. So apparently we have three extra senses that we're not typically taught about. I don't remember the exact names, but it was your head position, your joint positions in space. And then I think it says vestibular. That has a lot to do with balance. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense when I think about it, because, you know, athletes are probably have a really, really high and dialed in those types of senses. So it's really cool because I, I learned this from Holly and now I've been experimenting with it. In, in my own tutoring sessions and helping kids that sometimes have difficulty memorizing things while adding just a little like body position or head position changes. And it, it does seem to, it, at the very least, like get the kids more engaged. And so, you know, at, at the very least, so they're like having more fun learning. 
and we'll see if it uh, really pays off in the end. We'll see. I just I just started doing it, so I don't have the results back yet. But it does make a lot of sense to me because, like, I even think about sometimes I smell a certain thing, like um, like steak cooking on the grill or something, and it immediately triggers memories back to my childhood of growing up. So it makes a lot of sense for me to, the more senses we incorporate, seeing, hearing, smelling, even tasting, but also this like head position, body position, more we can incorporate those bits, the better, like more vivid story we can create and probably the better our brain will be able to store that information. So I think that's incredibly cool. Um, Probably a good idea to go check out some occupational therapist websites and get some more information on that. And of course, I'll include Holly's information. So if you want to have reach out and ask her any questions about that kind of stuff, it'd be really great because I bet she has a lot of great ideas for little exercises to inc incorporate those different senses. And then the only other thing that I wanted to hit on real quick is the power of routine, because I think this is important for kids, but also for adults. And just to illustrate the power of routine, I, I wanted to share a little story about myself. Like, I think there's so much information coming out now about how all the blue light from our, um, like our phones and our laptops, they're, they're, it like keeps us up, it disrupts our sleep patterns. But it's interesting for me because I've been watching TV like right before I go to bed, basically my entire life for as long as I can remember. So I've been training my brain to basically, as soon as I, it's like nighttime and I start watching TV, that all of a sudden I get really tired. So usually what happens is once I start to kind of feel a little bit tired, I'll go to bed and I'll actually start watching Netflix on my laptop. And then within like 10 minutes, I'll be out. I'll be like asleep. And it's funny because sometimes it'll take me like two weeks to watch like an entire movie because I'm watching it like 10, 15 minute clips at a time. And then I forget what's going on in the movie and I have to like start over. But anyway, um, but that's just interesting because since I've built such a powerful habit, such a powerful routine, it overrides the science of, oh, all this blue light from your laptop will actually keep you up at night. So just to go, goes to show like, you build a really strong, powerful routine or habit and be a really strong driving force and just be an indicator and a signal for your body to do certain things. So for me, it's to go to sleep. All right. So the last part of the interview, Holly's going to share some extra resources and books and stuff. So if you're more interested in this aquatic therapy or learning more about these alternative learning techniques, stay tuned for some really great resources. And of course, I will put links to a lot of it in the description if you'd rather check it out there so let's finish this bad boy up you have just like any other just like real simple tips or strategies for parents can do to help do at home and help kids or themselves and you know it can be related to the aquatics or the occupational therapy or whatever but i'm just wondering if you have any little extra things yeah, I have a couple of things I really like. Um, one of them kind of references another interview you did with the yoga instructor and she talked about breathing exercises. I actually have this app that I really like that's free and it just does simple even out breathing where you count four in, four out. They have little ones like the box breathing where you hold your breath, things like that, but it walks you through it and it has different colors. So I use that with a lot of my patients and families and that way, just like she talked about in the video too, OTs use breathing techniques too, because it triggers that parasympathetic response for your body to relax. And if you're really overwhelmed, you need that. So it's a tool across multiple professions. So I'd either reference that video and then I'll share that app with you so you can share it with everyone too. And a, an audio book that I really, really liked, especially during COVID and just the fact that my work and home were mixed together, that was really hard for me because I want to keep them separate, right? That's what everyone thinks. Work-life balance. I um, really have tried to destroy this concept now that I've read this book. It's called Off Balance and it's by Matthew Kelly. It's, it's on Audible. So if you have that through Amazon, you can get it and download it. And it's a little hard to wrap your head around, but it's this concept that instead of, you know, pitting work and life against each other work life balance like work is part of your life 
So why are they on this scale that is really unpleasant? So instead of pitting them against each other like a war, he proposes a new idea to measure personal, personal and professional satisfaction, which is something I'm really, I've taken to heart and it's worked out really, really well for me. So that if, am I, is my personal life satisfying? Great, I'm in a great place. Is my professional life doing great? Then there's nothing to worry about. If we don't, it has to be 40 hours on, has to be 40 hours off. That's stressful. You know, are you happy in all areas of your life? Are you satisfied with what you're doing? And if you are, then there's nothing wrong with anything. There's no need to quantify and calculate this like, oh, I worked 40 hours. And then especially when you own your own business, as I'm sure you understand, you kind of work a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you're like, oh, if you start measuring, I worked 80 hours this week. I only had this many hours of personal time versus like, you know, I had a lot to do this week for work. Am I professionally satisfied yet? Yeah, is, is my home life great too? Yeah, my family's pretty happy. They accommodated my high work schedule. There's no issue. So I really loved that book in particular. It really kind of gave me a new perspective and I've really taken it to heart. Because even in OT school, they always teach about balance. And I'm just like, you know, screw balance. <laughs> it's, it's not there anymore. Just let it go and use a different factor to measure what you consider successful for your life. And it has really helped me. And I think it would really help parents too, especially when they're thinking about, I didn't have enough spouse time. I had more kid time. Oh, the kid was in tutoring. They didn't have enough play time. You're thinking about oh, two hours on, one hour off. And it's like, you know what? Are, are the kids happy? Then you're doing a good job. Is everyone satisfied? <laughs> then we're doing great. So that, I really liked that one. So it's called Off Balance by Matthew Kelly. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think people, when they hear balance, they think of it as like, it has to be equal, you know, all parts equal. But I, I, I found more like you're saying, well, am I satisfied in each part of this life? It doesn't necessarily have to be the same time commitment, but if everything's going well in all these little areas, then I would call that balanced, you know, even if I'm right. not assigning the same amount of time to each one. I think so too. I think sometimes the word balance has gotten stigma by us over time. People always see, like when I hear the word balance, I only see that scale. Mm -hmm. So I think either like not using the word or just really reframing your perspective on what balance is, like you mentioned, is really the way to go about it. And I think, especially with the ongoing state of the world, uh, it's what we're going to have to do. Pitting things against each other and making them equal it's just not going to do it for us. So to cope more health in a more healthy way, you're going to have to measure differently. Awesome. I agree. All right, Holly. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing everything. Yeah. All Thank your you for having me. <laughs> uh, of course, my pleasure. Um, if anyone wants to follow up with you, learn more, or maybe if they're even interested in your services, where can they find you? So I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and I also have my own website. So my Instagram is at canoe, like the boat canoe, like this community. Okay. And then Facebook is my whole name, which is kind of a mouthful. It's community aquatics and occupational engagement. So if you don't want to remember all of that, you can just go to my website, which is www.canoecommunity.org. And then there's a little button for Facebook and Instagram. There's reviews on there. I also have a blog. Um, so if there's like a subject that someone watching this wants me to cover and they don't want to go down the, the dreaded Google hole <laughs> and find like all the wrong answers or all the bad news and they want something that's more educational and potentially a more positive light, I can write about those subjects as long as it's underneath my scope of expertise and provide that information too. I try to get new blog posts out uh, weekly. I've just been a little behind lately with that. <laughs> oh yeah, I know that one too. I, I've been writing a blog, but then like I was doing it maybe like one or two a week and then I started doing the show and now it's like more like once a month, but I'm <laughs> trying to. Right. Um, so I'm always open for new topics. So if families are like, I, I just got this diagnosis or I just read this thing about drowning and now I'm freaking out they can submit a contact form and they can just say, hey, I want a new blog post. Could you write about this? And then I'll try to write something that's not so scary and potentially more educational in that 
like so media driven, a little different. Awesome. All right. Well, Holly, thanks again. I mean, everyone that's watching, you should definitely have Holly because obviously she's got like very unique skill set here going on and she obviously has great energy. So it's been a pleasure having you on and hopefully we can see you again soon. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate your time. All right. Have a good one. All right. Another episode of Pandemic Parenting Completed. I hope you learned a lot. I know I did. I learned a whole bunch of stuff about aquatic therapy and alternative learning methods that I didn't know before. So really, really appreciate Holly coming on and sharing her knowledge. And per usual, if you have any questions or comments or you have questions you want answered on the show, feel free to write me at greg at Think and Evolve Academy. I love hearing from all of you. I love hearing from parents and I love trying to help you guys out and answer whatever you need answering. So have a great rest of your day and we will see you next week on Pandemic Parenting. Take it easy. Thank <laughs> you.